Well, I want to welcome you to our message this morning entitled, After Failure, with a big question mark. After Failure. You know, we are focusing on discipleship this year. Man, we have had some great messages this year. Our panels have been awesome. Our messages have been so good. And, you know, we're into this thing. We're into discipling people and investing into people and giving people the words of Jesus and teaching and and developing people. And, And really, there's nothing more rewarding than doing that. I mean, it's just amazing being involved in people's lives watching them go deeper with Jesus, watching them break free from addictions, uh, you know, seeing them become leaders in their own right and, and taking on other people and really investing into their life and kind of reciprocating that. It's just, it's just awesome. Nothing is more rewarding than investing into someone and watching them do that. It's just a wonderful, wonderful thing. And, you know, as you read in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, it says, You have heard me teach these things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now watch this. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. So part of this process that we're talking about of discipling people, it's like a threefold process, okay? Because we teach to teach to teach. See, that's what 2 Timothy is showing us. It says, you commit to faithful people who will be able to teach others also. So our goal when we're investing into people is to teach them how to teach other people and then encourage them and help them to take on other people of their own. I mean, that's what discipleship is supposed to look like. And this is a clearly it's what we're instructed to do. And, and the benefits, like I said, you know, there, there's just nothing more rewarding. And, and, and I know many of you have been on the receiving end of being able to be involved in people's lives and you know, whether it be in your homes and, you know, you're teaching them, you know, how to live life or, you know, working with your children or maybe a coworker that you're doing a Bible study with or a women's small group or a connect group or whatever. And you're just, you know, doing life with people and helping people. And it's just nothing like it. It's just, it's awesome. It's so awesome. It's so encouraging to <clears throat> be a part of that. But I want to take our next few minutes together and just talk about a topic that's, it's hard for us to talk about. And I want to be real candid about the topic that I want to talk about. Because if we're going to be discipling people and we're going to be pouring into people and helping people grow, we have to be prepared to know what to do when people fail. Or maybe even when we fail. You know, we fail people that we're discipling. And we're pouring into people and and we miss the mark ourselves. And so I want to take the next few minutes together and, and... unwrap this a little bit for us this morning, because, because when people fail or when we ourselves fail, it's, it's very difficult to deal with. And the unpleasant fact is, church, is that people are going to make mistakes, and so are we. We just are. And so we need to have a clear understanding of our own human tendencies, what, what, our, kind of what I call our triggers, our, our natural responses and our natural reactions in our flesh when we blow it or when someone else blows it. You know, Angela and I realized when our children were growing up that they were going to make mistakes, and we understood that it was our job to help them navigate those failures in life. You know, not just understand how to be successful and how to be overachievers, but also to understand when you miss the mark and when you fail, there are certain things that you need to do, or when other people's miss the mark and when they fail, there are certain things that, that you need to do. <clears throat> and so we understood this, and we taught our children that the enemy is always out to trap us. The devil, he's always out to get us. And one of the things that the devil will do in our lives is he'll take, an, he'll take a legitimate need in our life and then he'll tempt us to fulfill it in an illegitimate way. And the fact is, church, the devil doesn't have to lie to us over and over and over and over again if we believe him the first time. And just, and just run with what he gives us. Our enemy will wait for the most opportune time. I tell our young people all the time, the devil is very patient. He's been doing this a very long time. If it takes him a year to get you, two years to get you, three years to get you, four years to get you, he will be patient. He will wait, but he will look for the most opportune time to try to destroy what God is genuinely doing in our lives. And that's why the Apostle Paul warned us in Ephesians chapter 6, be on guard 
against your enemy. Take on the full armor of God every day because your enemy, the devil, he, he prowls like a roaring lion, come on, seeking whom he may devour. And the fact is, as humans, we miss the mark, you know, we miss the mark. And I think it's important for all of us to understand that, that our brothers and sisters in Christ are not our enemies. They're our family. The, the devil and spiritual forces in dark places, that's our enemy. Our flesh and the tendencies of our flesh, you know, that, that part of us, that dark part of our life, that, that's our enemy. And as humans, we sometimes, we, you know, we, we lose our way. We miss the mark. We pursue goals at all costs. We teeter on moral cliffs that we shouldn't. We, we get too far down a slippery slope and we can't get back up. We steal. We cheat. We lie. We deceive ourselves. We deceive others. We conceal our heart's true misguided intentions from people who love us the most. <clears throat> the fact is you can be a godly person and use poor judgment and get yourself in a place where you never really meant or thought you would ever be. And, and yet there we have all been at some point in our lives. And I think it's in these moments that, you know, we're not the friend that others deserve. We're not the partner that others chose, the, the child that our, our parents raised, the example that we wish to be, or, or, or even the person that we're capable of being. Yet, yet, it can happen to any of us. We're human. I often look in the mirror, and I'll, have, and I'll say this to myself. I'll say, you're one mistake away from messing everything up. You're just one decision away from messing everything up. Be wise. Be smart. Stay connected with the Lord. I love reading the Bible <clears throat> about different people in the Bible, and, and this is one of the big reasons that I love it, because the Bible is so real. You know, when you read the Bible... It doesn't paint this fake picture of all of these people in the Bible as being like superhuman people. You know, we've got the Avengers Endgame coming out. I'm really excited about seeing that movie, you know, and everybody's like, yeah, <laughs> you know, you, here, take my money. You can have it right now. I'm ready. But, you know, but, but we see all these, we, we see all these um, superhuman people, and man, I'm telling you, poor Chris Pratt, everybody got mad at him over the last movie because, you know, he let his emotions get in the way and he messed up the whole thing and everybody got destroyed. And those of you who hadn't seen the movie, you have no idea what I'm talking about. So rent the Avengers and, and the last one and watch it. But, you know, but he made a mistake. He, you know, he made a mistake and he missed the mark. And, and I love the Bible because the Bible doesn't just give us superheroes that are perfect. It gives us normal, everyday people who they put their sandals on one foot at a time, just like we do, and they made a lot of mistakes. And when I read the Bible, I'm encouraged because God used those imperfect people. Now, I never would have picked them, but God picked them. In Psalms chapter 73, verse 26, listen to this, it's, it's just so powerful. Lord, so, so many times I fail. I fall into disgrace. But when I trust in you, I have a strong and glorious presence protecting me and anointing me. Forever, you're all I need. You know, one of the things that I encourage people in is when I'm counseling them, when they fail is this, you have a choice. You have a choice. You know, we all have a choice. God has given us that ability through our relationship with him and through our new birth in Christ to have a choice, to make a decision. And, and the one thing that I encourage anybody in when they've messed up, when they fell is that, is that you have a choice. Just because we've, we've lost our way, it doesn't mean that, that we're lost forever. Just because we've made a mistake 
doesn't mean that everything that, that's over. You know, failure doesn't have to define us. It's how we respond that defines us. You know, I, I don't talk a lot about um, my testimony before I met Christ just because I like you guys knowing the other guy, <laughs> you know, because he's better and nicer and he's just a much better um, guy. But, you know, when, when I was growing up as a teen, man, I, I got in a lot of trouble. And a lot of you, you young guys here, you know, you don't know all the trouble. I got in a lot of trouble. And I'm not emotional about the fact that I got in trouble. I'm emotional about the fact that, I, that I'm talking about something that is really important to me. You know, I broke into schools and I vandalized stuff. I stole. I did a lot of things that I don't like talking about because it's really embarrassing. But as a teen, when I got into a lot of trouble, I had a choice. And when I got into my uh, latter years, and my early 20s, I began to look at my life and, and you know, I, I could either accept responsibility for my actions, change, repent, and become a pastor, or I could continue in that wrong decision-making process in my life and I could just become a person who was given to a life of crime. And I wouldn't be standing here before you today. And that's why I'm saying, listen to me, you have a choice. We all have a choice. It's not that you stumble, it's that you get back up. It's not that you did something wrong, but it's that you realize what's happening and you change. You change. Mistakes are bad, no doubt, but not learning from them it's worse. And let me tell you, it's painful. We've all been there. We've all experienced it in our own personal life. And, and you know, you can just never get too far off in left field when you live a life of humility and repentance before the Lord. Humility and repentance. Humility and repentance. You know, the Bible warns us often, be careful about your boasting. Be careful about thinking that you're somewhere that you're not. Be careful about thinking that you have, you have arrived at a point in life where you're not capable of making a mistake. Because the fact is, church, we are all capable of making a mistake. I, I want to talk about failure this morning, and I, I want to talk about responding to failure. I think we're, we've done a good job about encouraging us to disciple and getting involved in people's lives and, and making those connections and loving people and, and, and um, investing in people. And I think one of the ways to, to talk about what to do right in responding to failure is to kind of talk about what not to do when responding to failure. And one of the things that, that I've noticed um, just doing this as a pastor is, I don't know, it, it just always surprises me as a pastor when people mess up, how surprised other people act when people mess up. <gasps> Did you hear? Can you believe it? I can't believe <gasps> they did that. But honestly, you know, me being in the position that I am in, and I guess it just comes with the territory of being a pastor and counseling people week in and week out and year in and year out, it doesn't surprise me. Because I'm, I'm talking and dealing with people on a weekly basis who fail, who, who miss the mark, or people who are leading other people who made a mistake when they were leading them, and they, they miss the mark. So it, it really doesn't surprise me, and I don't think it should be shocking to us when people make mistakes, because the fact is, church, we all make big and small mistakes every week of our lives. Paul, why did you say that? How many of y'all have ever been there? No, why did, you, why did you act that way? There's been times I've said to myself, and you know, this is not a good practice, making derogatory remarks about yourself, but I don't know if you've ever just like gone like, stupid. Stupid. No. 
and you just wish, you know, you could take it back, right? The, the thought, the thing you did, the thing you said, how you handled something, you, you, you went out and bought something you shouldn't have bought or you did something you shouldn't have done, and it's like, oh. And this is one of the reasons that we have Jesus, and He's our Savior, because He's sent to save us from things like that. Amen? Oh, come on. Y'all got to do better than that. Amen? I mean, that's what Jesus is there for. And whether you're a parent responding to a child's mistake, or you're a mate responding to the other half, or you're a friend responding to a friend's mistake, or a coworker or a boss, I've seen a lot of wrong responses to failure. But the fact is, everybody responds and reacts differently to failure. And I think it's important whether we are on the receiving end and we have failed, or whether we are on the end where we are seeing someone who has failed, we have to understand that everyone responds differently. And we can't expect people to respond the way that we want them to respond. As a matter of fact, we can't do anything about how people respond. But here's what we can do something about. is how we will respond. And that's the most important thing. You know, probably the thing that I see the most that people do when, when people fail or when they mess up, or, or when we ourselves mess up, we, we tend to want to isolate ourselves. You know, we don't want to re- be around people. It, you know, d- let me insulate myself a little bit because it's embarrassing and it's hard and it's difficult. And, you know, I'd just rather not deal with people and, you know, you know having, to, having to face up to some of that stuff. And then for, for those of us who may be on the receiving end of it, you know, we don't know what to do with them. So we're indifferent and we're aloof. And because, you know, emotionally and spiritually, that's very hard to navigate. And, and I, I really don't want to have to deal with that right now because I've got other things going on in my life or that's just a hard thing for me to have to deal with. And so emotionally, I can't deal with that. Other people respond out of anger. They, they feel betrayed. They feel hurt. You, you, you know, I, I looked up to you and, and you let me down and, and you failed in some way. And, and now because of that, that really hurt me and I feel betrayed and, and we become angry. There's a whole range of emotions that we have to deal with when we fail or when other people fail. And then there's those that just, you know, they're always going to be in our corner no matter what. They're going to love us. Doesn't matter what we do. They're going to forgive us. They're going to be there for us. And those are those wonderful gems in our life that God's blessed us with. Those people that are just those diamonds that they're just going to be there no matter what. But sometimes even in that, that that can get distorted. And the enemy can take that and, and, and just say, you know what? I support you in whatever you do. You're not wrong in anything that you're doing. I support you. I'm for you. God supports you. God's for you. Do whatever you want to do. God loves you no matter what, regardless. And and in a sense, that is true. But oftentimes, all that is is just a justification for areas of failure in our own life. And birds of a feather flock together. And so we want to bring other people in to make us feel better about the sin that we're walking in ourselves. And so we have to be so very careful how we respond. And the truth is, church, God is going to allow all of us to encounter failure. He's going to allow us to encounter our own failure, and He's going to allow us to encounter failure of other people. And here's why. Because God is going to perfect us all in His love one way or the other. And the best way that we are perfected in God's love is when we encounter the failure either in our own lives or in the lives of those around us. And it's when you get in those moments, you find out that, you know what? A lot of us pretend that we're in a different place in our faith than we really are. And God uses failure to keep us real and not fake. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be fake. I don't want to be fake. I don't want to be plastic. I want to be real. The world's full of enough people who are plastic, and people need people who are going to be real. But what does that look like? 
You know, biblically, what does that look like? And I, you know, I can't think of a better way. You know, right now we're in our, in, our, in our midweek services. We're in our Sermon on the Mount. Man, we're learning about how Jesus teaches and what Jesus does. And, you know, obviously we, we're, we're all trying to become more and more like him, transfer, transformed into his glory. And so we look at him. But, there, but there's a, a moment in the Bible that I think we can all learn from. We're all familiar with this passage. If you want to go to John chapter 8 with me, let's just look at this together for a few minutes. John chapter 8, we're going to start with verse 1. It says, Jesus walked up on Mount of Olives near the city where he spent the night. Then at dawn, Jesus appeared in the temple courts again, and soon all the people gathered around to listen to his words. And so he sat down and he taught them. And then in the middle of his teaching, the religious scholars and the Pharisees broke through the crowd and they brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery and made her stand in the middle of everyone. And then they said to Jesus, teacher, we, we caught this woman in the very act of adultery. Doesn't Moses' law command us to stone to death a woman like this? Tell us, what do you say that we should do with her? They're only testing Jesus because they hope to trap him with his own words and accuse him of breaking the law of Moses. But Jesus didn't answer them. Instead, he simply bent down and he wrote in the dust with his finger. Angry, they kept insisting for an answer to their questions. So Jesus stood up and he looked at them and he said, now watch this, let's have the man who has never had a sinful desire throw the first stone at her. And then he bent over again and he wrote some more words in the sand. And upon hearing that, her accuser slowly left the crowd one at a time, beginning with the oldest to the youngest, convicted in their conscience. Until finally Jesus was left alone with a woman still standing there in front of him. And he stood back up and he said to her, Dear woman, where are your accusers? Is there no one here to condemn you? And looking around, she replied, I see no one, Lord. And then Jesus said, Listen, then I certainly don't condemn you either. Go and from now on be free from a life of sin. And then Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. And those who embrace me will experience life-giving light. And they will never walk in darkness. But what a great example from our master. Man, there's so much that we can learn there looking at Jesus and how Jesus dealt with people when they miss the mark. I, I, I want you to notice that Jesus didn't avoid the woman. He didn't turn and walk the other way when he saw her coming. Jesus wasn't rude. He wasn't aloof. He didn't look down his nose at her like his like he was the son of God or something. Jesus didn't freak out. He didn't lose it over what she had done. Jesus didn't gloss over her sin and say it was okay. No, Jesus simply called her sin what it was, sin. But he didn't condemn her in her sin. He forgave her her sin and then he instructed her to go and live a life free from sin. You know, we have to cultivate relationships built upon accountability and encouragement. As believers, that's what we're called to do. We're called to do it with our children. We're called to do it with our mates. We're called to do it with our coworkers and our friends, with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We cultivate relationships built upon accountability and encouragement. But, but what has to guide every response and decision that we make is love and truth. Love and truth. Love and truth. And you can't separate love and truth. Love and truth is like wet and water. They go together. It's like faith and works. Wherever there's love, there has to be truth. And wherever there's truth, there has to be love. These two must come together. Because it's hard to receive truth without love. I've had some people bring truth to me before without love. You wouldn't believe it. But I've literally been up here preaching a sermon. And after I was done, I've had people walk up to me and rebuke me for what I preached. After I've been working on it all week, praying over it. They come up and rebuke me and get on to me for what I said and how, how wrong it was. And it may have been wrong. I don't know. Maybe I did miss the mark. But it's hard to receive that correction without love. It's just hard. And it's impossible to have a loving relationship with people without truth. 
Because relationship has to be built upon honesty and truthfulness. See, that's why it's important in our families, there's honor. Honor's so important in our homes. You know, all, all you young people, well, I'm going to tell you something, you need to honor your mother. Honor your mother. Honor her. And everything that she does, you honor her. Well, why not the dad? Listen, if you honor your mom, it'll naturally flow to your father. But mothers need to be honored. And another thing that's so important, you know, and, and not that I'm all for setting up rules in homes, because I don't, I don't believe in a, in a law-driven home or a legalistic family or, or a, a rule-driven home. But a, another thing in families that you don't ever want to do is you don't want to lie. That's one of the Ten Commandments. You shall not lie. Well, why, why, not, why not lie? Because relationships ha- have to be built upon truth. And when you lie to each other, you can't have relationship. And see, relationship is what it's all about. The mistake that we most often make is we choose one or the other when we're dealing with failure, and we've got to choose both. And we've got to walk in both. The mistake that we make when dealing with people is we don't choose both. In 1 Peter 4, it says, Love covers a multitude of sin. And I'll never forget, I was having a conversation one day with um, the founder of our church, Hetty Lou Brooks. It was years ago, and you know, she was at, the, at our early service this morning. And I told her, I said, you probably don't even remember this conversation, but it was a life-changing moment for me. And I had several of those with her. And that's why I love discipleship so much. See, discipleship can just be having moments of conversation at church. But I was out in the parking lot, and I was really distraught because You know, I work in the position of being an administrator over our young adults that come through our internship called Leaders Academy. And one of the unpleasant things about my job is sometimes I have to be the guy that decides whether somebody stays or goes. And I hate it. There's nothing about it that I like. It's one of the hardest things that I do. Because I understand that I'm dealing with people. And I'm dealing with their lives. And that's an important thing to me. And so I was out in the parking lot and I had just had to let a couple of students go, and man, I was really weighted down, and I'd been upset, and tears were in my eyes, and Hetty was having a conversation with me, and she said something to me that changed my life. She said, she said, Paul, let me tell you something. Love is wonderful, and we all need to give love to people, because love covers a multitude of sins. But then she said something to me that just impacted me. She says, but love never set anybody free. The truth is what will make you free. And I think we have to be people who walk in love, but we speak the truth. My decisions have not always been popular with the interns, but they do know where I stand. And they always will know where I stand. And there's Interns that have come through here and 10 years, 15 years later, I've gotten letters. I've gotten emails from interns that I let go 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and they've written me back and said, this is the best thing that ever happened to me. Changed my life. Had one guy been through multiple divorces. And he was digging out his old notes 15, 20 years ago. You just never know what kind of impact you're going to have with people, but you know, becoming love and loving people is so hard. It's not easy because it's easy to talk about people. I mean, it just comes natural to us with our, our fallen human nature. It's easy to talk about people, it's easy to gossip about people, it's easy to judge and be critical of people and go, oh, I can't believe this year. Oh, oh my gosh, that's terrible. And it is. But it takes a mature person to love someone through their failure. And here's the thing, church. The thing about failure and loving somebody through a failure, it usually doesn't take care of itself in one day. It's a process. And sometimes it takes weeks. And sometimes it takes months. And sometimes it takes years to love someone through process in their life. 
Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 says, My beloved friends, if you see a believer who is overtaken with a fault, may the one who overflows with the Spirit seek to restore him. Win him over with gentle words, which will open his heart to you, and it will keep you from exalting yourself over him. Love empowers us to fulfill the law of the anointed one as we carry each other's troubles. And if you think you're too important to stoop down to help another, then you're too important in your own mind. You know, I want to encourage our church to love people. You know, we're talking about discipleship and we're talking about investing into people. But I think it's important that we talk about what happens when people mess up and how do I navigate that and what do I do? Or it may be in my own life. You know, what do I do when I blow up, when I make mistakes and I was leading somebody and I fell into a ditch myself. You know, I made a bad decision myself. I want to encourage us to be people who walk in a spirit of love and walk in a spirit of truth, especially when people fail. But genuine love and genuine truth is put to the test when people fail. And like I said, sometimes we can think we're in a place spiritually where we're really not, and God will reveal it to us. He says, look, this is where I want to perfect you in your love, and I'm going to allow you to walk through this uncomfortable situation, and I'm going to teach you how to be my man and my woman through this process. Can I have an amen? You know, maybe you're here today, and you failed. Maybe at some point in your life, I mean, you just, there's been something that you did or and and I don't know maybe it was an abortion maybe it was a divorce and a marriage that ended really really bad or maybe you're estranged from a child you know you've had an argument with and you you guys are just or, or maybe a sibling in your family but I want to encourage you you have to forgive yourself God forgives you don't make yourself bigger than God. Don't make yourself bigger than God. If God can forgive you, then you have to forgive yourself. And we have to forgive others. Because people are going to miss the mark all the time. They're going to offend you and they don't mean to. They're going to hurt your feelings and maybe they did or maybe they didn't. They're going to let you down. You're going to have expectations that they don't rise to. And it's hard to deal with when these kinds of things happen to us. But, but you know what? This is what authentic Christian living looks like. This is what it looks like. You've got to be willing to get your hands messy. You've got to be willing to get in the muck and the mire with people sometimes. Not all the time, but sometimes it's required. It's something that we're called to do. See, when people fail, I want to encourage our church and our people to walk through them in their valley of struggle. Don't, don't abandon them in the moment that they need you. But don't tell them what they want to hear. Speak truth to them in love. Hold them accountable to the high and holy calling that God has placed on their life. Because when we condone what people do or we tell them that it's okay, they live in a place in life that is way beneath what God has called them to live in. Don't talk about their failures. You know, when I meet with people, that's not, that's not really our conversation. I mean, we, we have to address it, but that's, that's not the focus of my conversation Talk to them about who they're becoming. Talk to them about the hope and the bright future that God has for their life, even though they have failed. And we got to think that even in our own hearts, in our own minds, when we miss the mark, we've got to think that. We've got to know, you know what? God's got something more for me. I'm not going to be defined by this failure. I'm not going to make a monument of this moment in my life, but I'm going to move forward into what God has for me. Be the person that they can count on to love them. Be the person that they can count on to encourage them. But also be the person that they can count on that you will speak truth to them. So there's one thing about failure. When other people fail, 
I don't know about you, church, but it's very humbling. It's very humbling in my own personal life, you know, especially being in a position of leadership. When I watch people fail and I watch people go through the Lord's discipline in their life, it's very humbling for me. But you know what it causes me to do? It causes me to take a magnifying glass to my own life and say, you better pay attention. You better inspect. You better look. And you better make the changes that you need to make. Because the fact is, God loves all of us enough that he'll deal with us in the privacy of the oven. The Holy Spirit, you know, we get those little taps, those little things all throughout. Don't go there. Don't, th don't think that. Don't say that. Guard your heart. The Holy Spirit's always tapping. But if, we'll, if we harden our heart to the Holy Spirit, here's what he'll do. He'll take us out of the oven. He'll put us in the frying pan. And then everybody gets to watch. And it's hard. It's hard. I don't like seeing that happen to people, and I certainly don't enjoy the experience myself, but I've had it happen to me. But you know what? I'd rather the Lord do that in my life than allow me to be lost in my sin and to fall into the bondage that it produces in my own personal life. Kind of a heavy message this morning. And as I close, I just want to say it's important to remember that God makes people and people make issues, but people aren't issues. And they're not projects either. They're people. Just like us. And we got to learn how to love people. And so this year as we are called by God to disciple people, we're not just called to disciple them when they're doing everything right. We're called to disciple them when they don't. And we got to know even in our own life, I think a lot of people, they're afraid to step up to the plate and disciple people because, well, well Paul, I've just made so many mistakes, you know. Who am I to talk to somebody about, you know, having a good marriage when I failed in my own? Who am I to encourage somebody to be a good parent when I didn't do so good myself? Listen, you're living way beneath God's high and holy calling for your life if you allow the devil to lie to you and keep you in that place. The Bible clearly says there is no condemnation, come on, for those who are in Christ Jesus. And it is for freedom that Christ has set us all free. So walk in the freedom that Jesus provided. Will you stand with me this morning? Can we give God a hand clap for his goodness and his faithfulness? Come on, don't patty cake. Let's give God some praise in this place. Father, we love you today. We worship you today. And God, we ask you to help us. Help us, God, to be the people that you've called us to be. This week, I want to encourage you, reach out. Reach out. Be used by God this week. Don't just say it, live it. Let it be seen to everybody around you. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. amen.